Director Goodsky reminisced about the day when the Council had presented the six lances with the simple yet sturdy adamantine tags, each engraved with the owner's initials. It was a concept crafted by the lances themselves, a testament to their pragmatic approach to survival. The lances had earnestly explained to the Council the need for something nearly indestructible. They argued that even if their bodies were obliterated, these tags would endure, serving as a means of identification. It was a grim reminder of mortality, a memento mori, underscoring the constant threat looming over them. Director Goodsky vividly recalled the moment when the Council had made a light-hearted jest, their casual demeanor in stark contrast to the grave expressions of the Six Lances. They had asked if there existed a force capable of obliterating the Lances beyond recognition. Goodsky had chuckled along with them, even though deep down, the awareness of such formidable beings lingered in the depths of their thoughts. In Goodsky's mind, the memory was etched with a mix of amusement and apprehension. The Council's jests had highlighted the harsh reality. The Six Lances were not invincible. Despite their adamantine tags and unwavering determination, there were indeed forces in the world that could erase them from existence. The knowledge weighed heavily on Director Goodsky, a reminder of the fragile balance between power and vulnerability in their tumultuous world. In the depths of Director Goodsky's confusion, the premature appearance of the tag confounded her. It felt too soon, a move ahead of her carefully calculated timeline. She had believed there were 15 to 20 more years before their adversaries would make their decisive moves. The realization hit her like a sudden storm, shattering her sense of security. I thought I had time, she whispered to herself, the weight of the situation pressing down on her. I thought we had time. Abruptly, Arthur's inquisitive voice cut through her thoughts, grounding her back to the present moment. Director? Art's perceptive tone snapped her out of her daze, reminding her of the need to maintain composure. Ah, yes. Arthur, do you mind if I hold on to this? It's safe to assume that the Council will want this back, Goodsky said, carefully regulating her voice to avoid rousing any suspicion in the unusually sharp young man. Things are changing, aren't they? Arthur's words were meant to be a question, but they carried an unspoken certainty. Goodsky hesitated, torn between the urge to confide in Arthur and the fear that the young man might already be privy to critical information. Should she reveal the truth to Arthur? Or perhaps, did Arthur already possess knowledge that could alter their course? Goodsky pondered her options, acutely aware of the delicate balance between secrecy and trust. Yes, but it isn't something for you to worry about. Not yet, at least, she said, trying to reassure the perceptive young man. Her attempt at a comforting smile felt hollow, for she realized the message was as much for herself as it was for Arthur. The burden of their reality weighed heavily on Goodsky's shoulders, and in Arthur's eyes, she saw a reflection of the innocence they were trying so hard to preserve. Yes, he was just a child. It wouldn't be fair to involve him in the complex affairs of the continent, especially considering the gravity of the situation. But the nagging thought persisted. What if he already knew something crucial? Did you perhaps see whatever Alea fought against? She chose her words meticulously, ensuring her question revealed nothing of her internal turmoil. No, I didn't, Art replied with unwavering confidence. His words should have reassured her, yet an inexplicable suspicion gnawed at the corners of her mind. Still, it made little sense for him to conceal information about an event as significant as this. Regardless of her doubts, she pushed them aside suspecting the boy would lead nowhere productive. It was irrational to assume he was hiding anything about such a significant event, even though her instincts disagreed. Despite her lingering doubts, a wave of relief washed over Director Goodsky. He didn't seem to have pieced together the puzzle. I see. Well, enough about this topic. You must be worried about how everyone is doing, Goodsky said, offering a soft, relieved smile. Concealing her anxiety behind a facade of calm, Goodsky redirected the conversation, hoping to alleviate his concerns and maintain the innocence he deserved at his age. In Art's perspective, the director's reaction left a sour taste lingering in his mouth. 
Her response sounded oddly relieved at his words. He decided to let it go, choosing not to dwell on his suspicions about the people around him. Assuming that she had avoided probing further for his sake, he decided to change the topic. Yeah, how is everyone doing? He asked, trying to steer the conversation away from the discomforting topic. As you may have already deduced, your classmates weren't very badly injured, she explained. We sent them to the Guild Infirmary Hall to be cared for, and thankfully, most were able to come to school today. Professor Glory was actually the most wounded, but she refused healing until all her students were treated. I heard she even paid a visit to your family to notify them of your disappearance after transporting everyone back. That's good, that's good. And how is Tess doing? Art inquired, concerned about his friend. Good Sky's face contorted with a hint of worry, her words carefully chosen. Tess. Tess is okay, she replied, her hesitation evident, making Art wonder if there was something more to the story. What exactly do you mean by that? Art raised a brow, his curiosity piqued as he probed for a more detailed response, feeling an uneasy stir within him. There were some complications in the final stages of her assimilation, she spoke quietly. Virion is currently looking after her, but she has yet to awaken. Complications? His voice came out fiercer than he intended, the concern evident in his tone. You need to understand that the final leg of assimilation is when the beast will struggles the hardest. Right now, Tessia and the Elderwood Guardian are fighting for control. Thus far, there has never been a case where the receiver of the will falls into a coma to this extent. Our theory is that there must be something peculiar about the beast, will you gave her Arthur, replied Good Sky earnestly. Wait, was this his fault? Had he put Tess in danger? A flurry of thoughts raced through his mind as he tried to think of an explanation for why such a thing might have occurred. There was something peculiar about the Elderwood Guardian. What was it? It was undeniably powerful, but Art couldn't help but wonder if it surpassed the strength of other S-Class mana beasts. Since it had been his first time fighting one, he lacked a point of comparison. Peculiar? His mind flashed back to the dungeon, focusing on what Alea had shared with him. She had mentioned that the Blackhorn demons were causing the monsters to mutate and grow stronger. Was that what had happened? Had he unwittingly given Tess a potentially corrupted beast core? No, that couldn't be right. He recalled Aaliyah explaining how the beast core of the serpent she defeated had mysteriously disappeared. Shouldn't that have happened to the Elderwood Guardian's beast core as well then, if it was tainted? Arthur, are you okay? Director Goodsky's concerned voice pulled him back from the deep abyss of his thoughts. Yeah, just thinking, he said, his gaze fixed on the night view of the city, his mind churning with worry and confusion. In any case, Virian is currently looking after her in your training room. Would you like to go visit them now? Director Goodsky offered a reassuring smile to Art. Yeah, I'd like that. Go on ahead then because even I have not been updated on the situation. Virian has not let anyone in, but I feel like you'd be an exception. I must make a trip to the council to inform them of what happened. When she mentioned the council, Good Sky suddenly looked infinitely older. Is it okay for the council to meet without Grandpa Virian present? Art asked. Director Good Sky shook her head before replying. Virian is in no state to be bothered with this matter, not while his precious granddaughter is unconscious. And besides, him being there with Tess is the only reason Alduin and Marial can stand to be away from their daughter and remain with the council. I see. Well, I hope you keep me informed on this matter. With that, Art made his way to the door. My only concern is that you may have to be a lot more involved this time than you'd wish to be. Director Goodsky heaved a sigh, then a gust of wind enveloped her, whisking her away. As Art descended in the elevator, he felt Sylvie bristle beside him. I feel Mama. He moved slowly toward the training room assigned to him, his steps burdened by an unusual heaviness. The prospect of Tess being injured weighed heavily on his mind. He decided to postpone visiting everyone else. He knew they were all safe. I said, I feel Mama. Sylvie thumped his forehead with her paw. I know. Art waved her paw away, 
refocusing his attention on the giant double door entrance he was approaching. Ouch. The skin under his dimension ring suddenly burned as if something wanted to come out. Ignoring the sensation, there were more urgent matters to address. He placed both palms on the door's surface and pushed it inward. When the door swung open, an unfamiliar, sinister aura visibly surged forward, attempting to trap Art. This dark fog felt like thousands of thorny vines coiling around his arms and legs. Who's the... Arthur. Grandpa Virian's husky voice boomed from within the noticeably dark wave, emanating from a specific focal point. Yeah, it's me, Gramps. What's going on? Art yelled over what sounded like the crashing of an ocean's waves against a cliff. God, am I glad you're still alive, brat. I'm becoming somewhat thankful for your cockroach-like tenacity. Come over here. I need your help. Still confused by the unfolding events, Art chose to ignore Gramps' slightly insulting metaphor and walked carefully toward him. The sinister aura grew stronger. Something was tearing small holes in his clothing and in his skin, causing him to bleed. Willing Mana to shield both Sylvie and himself, Art made his way toward the source of the aura, using Grandpa Virian's hazy figure as a guide. Each step felt like pushing against a reinforced wall. As he got closer, he could faintly make out a figure lying in front of Gramps. The origin of this ominous aura. By the time Art finally reached Grandpa Virian, he winced from the searing pain caused by his dimension ring. The pain had intensified as he approached. Gramps wasn't in good shape. His pale face was drenched in sweat as he struggled to suppress the oppressive aura emanating from the figure at his feet, but to little avail. Art took a closer look, and what he saw made his eyes widen in surprise. What in the... Tess? Tendrils of vines completely enclosed the figure Art assumed was Tess. The thick, dark aura had made it difficult for him to discern the identity of the figure from a distance. How much time has passed on the outside, brat? I think I've been holding in this foul aura for a day or so, since she came back from the dungeon, Grandpa Virian said, his voice tinged with weariness, followed by a weary chuckle. What's happening to her, Gramps? Art asked, his concern evident. He couldn't recall anything like this happening during his assimilation of Sylvia's dragon will. Honestly, I'm not sure. Typically, the purpose of assimilation is to enable the host's body to gradually withstand and control the beast will's power, but in this case, it seems to be the opposite. I'm beginning to worry that this beast's will is trying to take over Tess's body, Grandpa Virian replied, his voice trembling with unease. How is that possible? I've never heard of anything like that happening. Art's brows furrowed deeply as he searched his mind for a possible cause. His thoughts kept returning to the mana beasts that had been corrupted by the black-horned demons. I'm not so sure. I feel like that Elderwood Guardian you fought might have been mutated, Virian said, his voice hoarse, indicating he was likely at his breaking point. Art moved forward, prepared to take over for Gramps, still ignoring the burning sensation from his ring, although it was growing increasingly painful. It happened before his hands could touch the surface of the cocoon Tess was in. He recognized the sound of flesh tearing and instantly, instinctively shifted his body in hopes of dodging in time. Q, Papa, Arthur. Sylvie's and Virian's voices were muffled against the pounding of his eardrums. A bloodstain began spreading over Art's shredded shirt. The spear of twisted vines, originally aimed straight for his heart, had caught him in the side when he dodged. His heart pounded with a force strong enough to break free of his ribcage at the thought of death looming before him. It felt different from the other near-death experiences he'd had. It was almost instantaneous. In that split second, he could have died, and the weight of the thought of what would have happened to Tess and Grandpa Virian weighed heavily on him. Another tendril shot out at Art. Barely dodging it again, he grimaced at the feeling of blood trickling down his cheek. A mad laugh died on his lips as he took in their situation. Grandpa Virian's hands were literally on the cocoon, but as soon as Art got near her, a flurry of spear-like vines automatically locked onto him, ready to kill. Deep down, Art knew that Tess was still mad at him. He parried the next dark, spear-like tendril before things could worsen. The cocoon wrapped around Tess began expanding as an uncountable number of vines surfaced from the ground beneath her. Coo! 
Art heard Sylvie chirp near Gramps. Papa, you're okay. Grandpa Virian's shoulders loosened as he let out a sigh of relief. I thought you were done for, brat. What's happening now? Yeah, that was... a little too close for comfort. And I honestly have no clue what's happening now, Gramps. Maybe your granddaughter doesn't like me so much anymore. Art managed to shoot him a smirk, making Virian chuckle despite the dire situation they were in. Another thick layer of vines intertwined around the ones already forming Tess's cocoon, and dozens of tendrils began positioning themselves to, once again, shoot at Art. Just him. Coo! Sylvie chirped anxiously. What do we do? Perched next to Grandpa, Sylvie tilted her head in confusion. The enemy was her mama. I want you to stay with Grandpa Virian. She's only aiming at me, Art said, his voice determined, instructing Sylvie while keeping his focus on the impending threat. After dodging the discharge of tendrils, Art moved away from Gramps and Sylvie. Grandpa Virion was drained of all his mana after suppressing the dark aura for almost two days straight, while Sylvie was better off not interfering until Art knew exactly what the implications would be. What's more, Tessa's was becoming more creative in her attacks. Her next wave of tendrils was laced with sharp thorns. With each new onslaught from the Spears of Vines, Art became more convinced that the Beast Will was dead, set on trying to kill only him and it wasn't helping that his ring was burning to an almost unbearable degree. Could it be that the Elderwood Guardian's dying will was hoping to take revenge on him since he was the one who defeated it down in the dungeon? Art hoped he would live long enough to find out if that really was the case. Frustrated, Art withdrew his sword from his dimension ring, but something else came out with it. As Down's ballad appeared in his hand, a small shining orb shot out of the ring toward the cocoon. It was the marble-sized orb that the homeless storekeeper had given him. Sparkling with an array of colors, it bolted toward the enlarging cocoon. What the hell? Grandpa Virian noticed it too, but he only gazed at Art in confusion, probably thinking he had done it intentionally. Streaks of light escaped from the crevices between the vines as the orb sank into the cocoon. Before they even had the chance to wonder what was going on, there was an explosion from within the cocoon strong enough that it threw Virian and Sylvie, who were closest, several yards away. As the debris from the explosion subsided, the cocoon revealed a menacing, naked, black-haired Tess. The orb sank into Tess's stomach where her monocore was, and her sickly complexion returned to normal. No, better than normal. Her now flawless, pearly skin seemed literally radiant, and her black hair shifted back to its original gunmetal silver hue. Her physical appearance wasn't the only thing that changed. As the orb disappeared into her abdomen, Tessa's unconscious body was completely surrounded by an aura Art had never seen before, distinctly different from the usual mana existent in the atmosphere, in an almost mystical way. She was enveloped by a scorching flame comprised of brilliant emerald gems that lifted her unconscious body off the ground. Millions of green, leaf-shaped embers made up this unique aura, as the emerald aura grew, the once black vines turned a serene jade green. Even as the mesmerizing aura expanded, for some reason, Art didn't fear it. Then, before it reached any of them, the aura shrank back and dissipated. As Tess's figure fell, Art jumped up and retrieving his adventurer's coat from the dimension ring, swiftly wrapped it around her bare body as he held her in his arms. The oppressive dark aura that had filled the training room was completely gone, and more importantly, Tess was safe. Mmm, not now, Arthur. Too soon, Tess mumbled with a sleepy, playful smile. Relief washed over Art, and he laughed, a genuine sound of joy escaping him at Tess's sleep talk and the mere fact that she was okay. Tessia! Grandpa Virian came running, Sylvie dangling from his long white hair, She's okay, Gramps. She's just sleeping now. Art set her down gently and sank onto the floor, his strength finally giving out. Both Sylvie and Gramps began meticulously inspecting the slumbering Tess. Then they heaved a sigh of relief as well. She is okay. Gramps slumped down beside Art while Sylvie curled up next to Tess. For a brief moment, they all just stared blankly at the other end of the training grounds, too tired to even think. While I'd normally smack you for getting an eyeful of my granddaughter's bare body, 
I'll take into account the circumstances and let this one go, Gramps said tiredly. Praise be to your benevolence, Art huffed, falling back on the soft, grass-like moss. He shifted his softening gaze back toward Tessia. I'm glad you're okay, brat. This girl would have been devastated if you hadn't made it. He paused, and thank you for saving my granddaughter back at the dungeon, and now. Virian's voice grew quiet as he said this. What makes you think I saved her, Gramps? Art replied without getting up, using his hands to support his head. Call it a grandfather's intuition. With your abilities, I know that if you were only thinking of yourself, you wouldn't end up in dangerous situations like these. So again, thank you. The sincerity in his voice was confirmed as his eyes met Art's. Ugh, forget it. Don't get so serious like that all of a sudden. You're scaring me. Art rolled to one side, his back facing Grandpa Virian. So when did you get back? Your family knows you're alive, right? Gramps replied. Of course. I got home last night and spent some time with my family earlier today. Silence hovered between them for a few seconds before Art spoke again. Gramps, I'm sorry. I... I should have rushed back. I just assumed she'd be fine once she woke up, since she had finished the last leg of assimilation with her beast will back at the dungeon. If I'd known things could go wrong like this, I would have rushed here as soon as I got back. He turned to look at Virian, almost pleadingly. Back when Art was assimilating with Sylvia's beast will, Virian had explained to him that there was one final wave of struggle from the beast will before the assimilation was completely over. He had told him that was normal. He should have prepared for the worst. He almost lost her today. The thought scared him more than he would have ever believed possible in his past life. Your parents probably had their fair shares of worries raising you, huh? Unexpectedly, Grandpa Virian gave a soft chortle. What? Yeah, I guess, Art responded, thrown off by his sudden question. You did good in going to your family first. Tessia has her family to take care of her. She's not alone, you know. You probably thought of this when you decided to spend the day with them. Your family probably needed you to be there for them as well, since you gave them such a scare. Don't forget that. Don't be sorry for spending that much needed time with your family. Grandpa Virian patted Art's back consolingly. Art didn't know what to say. He was thankful that Virian knew him well enough to not need an explanation or an excuse. Again, a tranquil silence hung over them until Art finally got around to asking the question that had been clawing at the back of his mind. Hey, Gramps, how much do you know about the Six Lances? He asked, keeping his gaze focused on Sylvie, who had fallen asleep curled up next to Tess. The Six Lances? Why the sudden curiosity? Virian asked after a while. Art didn't answer. Accepting his silence, Virian responded tactfully. What exactly do you want to know about them? After a bit of thought, Art started off with a simple question. How strong are they? Virian let out a slow breath. Brat, let me start by asking you this. How strong do you imagine white core mages to be? Art's brows furrowed as he began calculating how many mages it would take to defeat a single white core mage. It took roughly 20 solid yellow core mages to hold off a single silver core mage, but would it take fewer silver core mages than that to beat a white core mage? Or was the power level increase exponential? I'm not really sure, Gramps, Art finally said, defeated. To make it easier for you, we'll use myself as a unit of measurement. I don't ever recall explicitly telling you this, but I'm a mid-silver core mage. It would take about 10 of me to keep one mid-white core mage at bay. And that's being optimistic, Grandpa Virian explained, chuckling softly. Ten of you, Art muttered under his breath. Now Cynthia is high silver. Even being generous, it would take around six or seven of her to keep one mid-white core at bay. Virian shrugged as he spoke. Art couldn't imagine his current self being able to defeat that many Virians or good skies. Perhaps if he were to release the second phase of his dragon's will, he might be barely able to contend with three Grandpa Virians. However, the backlash would be tremendous. I don't get it. Where did these abnormally strong figures come from, and why haven't they decided to just take control of a kingdom? I mean, with their strength, it's not like any king or queen can give them much of a fight. 
What's been keeping the royal family in power when there are white core mages capable of slaughtering them and their armies with ease? Art asked, trying to make sense of this world's government system. You have an excellent point. You're right. By strength alone, the six lances, or any white core mage for that matter, could probably wipe out a kingdom on their own. Grandpa Virian glanced over at Tess to make sure she was still sleeping. Before I say anything more, this will need to be kept an absolute secret from Tessia. I want her to stay ignorant of these rather dark matters, at least until she's older. Grandpa Virian had a tender smile on his face as he looked at his granddaughter. Art nodded. Hmm, I'll keep it a secret. I'll explain where they came from after, but as to the strength of each of the six lances. They are now stronger than regular white core mages, but before being knighted, most of them were actually only silver core mages. Gramps spoke with a faraway, peaceful expression. Huh? That makes no sense, Art began. Brat, how do you think the royal families, without any major powerhouses in line for the throne, have stayed in power since the formation of the Three Kingdoms? His peaceful expression disappeared as he peered at Art, his face clearly depicting his mixed feelings. He continued, this is classified information, known only to the royal families of each race, but I'm telling you because, somehow, I know you'll need this information in the future, and I know you'll be able to handle it. He let out a heavy sigh that seemed to contain a bit of his very soul. Do you believe in deities? The world of Arthur's past, the world where he lived as a king, still came regularly to mind. It had been a life of isolation for him, but it wasn't as if he'd loathed every moment of his near 40 years there. He had especially enjoyed visiting the orphanages and playing with the children. Of course, most of the boys considered sword fighting and Kai training forms of play, so whenever he went, he ended up spending hours teaching them. Art remembered one day rather explicitly when a boy in the orphanage, Jacob, asked him a question. Brother Gray, do you believe in God? He had asked, looking up as he tugged on Art's sleeve. Art had never believed in God or any higher beings, as some people did. How could there be a God in a world where your level of martial strength determined how you could live your life? Parents who birthed physically weak or crippled babies were considered failures, often humiliated and ridiculed by others. And those babies, even if they did live past adolescence, would never be able to amount to anything. They would have about as much recognition as a fly buzzing in someone's face annoying, useless, better off dead. No matter how beautiful and charismatic a woman was, she would only amount to a high-class prostitute if she didn't have enough strength to at least be considered mediocre among practitioners. Even those old bastards in the council who sat on their asses all day and used everyone like pawns had once been grand fighters and famous figures. How could a god exist in a world like that? Even if a god or deity had existed in Art's previous world, he certainly wasn't very merciful or loving, let alone fair.